everyone, the Green Scorpion here, and what a wonderful era we live in for smaller game studios. The passion you get from a scrappy team of auteurs is hard to match in AAA titles. Whether they're making unofficial sequels to games nearly forgotten, or charting new territory and combining genres. One of my favorite trends to come out of this is the rhythm action game. Games like Devil May Cry and Bayonetta have always had a sort of flow to their combos. Now just put a beat to it and suddenly you got yourself a kick-ass soundtrack that you can literally kick ass with. I once thought I'd found my favorite of these with no straight roads, we even made a countdown about its boss fights. However, a new contender has since come for the throne, Tango Gameworks Hi-Fi Rush. Rendered in eye-popping cel-shaded color, Hi-Fi Rush tells the story of wannabe guitarist Chai as he joins a ragtag rebellion against an all-encompassing faceless corporation. I say faceless, but actually the mugs behind the scenes are pretty memorable. And today, I'm gonna give them the NSR treatment and rank them worst to best. No, 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 no. Stop right there. Mech? What are you doing here? Give it a second. So we're finally doing this, huh? You know it. Awesome. Introduce yourself. Hello, audience. I'm Mecha Soul Man. If you're a fan of Oscar's channel, you've seen some of my work editing the highlights. I'm a little new to the countdown game, but on my channel I do long-form retrospectives on, well, anything I like, really. Shimigami Tensei, Dead or Alive, and I was planning on doing a deep dive on Hi-Fi Rush when I messaged Oscar in hopes of doing this collab. I'm not really one to shamelessly plug my content. Fine, I'll do it then. If you guys like this video, then head over to Mech's channel afterwards and check him out. Highly recommend his Tales of Zillia 1 and 2 videos. Thanks. Dude, you nervous? Well, I mean, this is probably going to be the only chance I'll get to collaborate with you on anything, so I'm both excited and nervous at the same time. Take a breath, my guy. It's all good. How about you explain them how we're going to rank these bosses? Throughout Hi-Fi Rush, we butt heads with Vandalay Technologies and its six larger-than-life executive leaders. None of Hi-Fi Rush's bosses are bad, let that be clear. It's not a matter of trimming out the fat, just elevating the great moments from the good. To rank higher on this list, we want satisfying boss battles that keep the flow of the game going, requiring quick reflexes from the player without feeling unfair. Hard is better than easy in this case, but the most important thing is maintaining the player's immersion so they can jam to these battles the same way they would jam to a song. That's not just attack patterns and frame data, it's a big part of this game and its story and its spectacle. The best boss fights in this game are interlaced with moments of shock, humor, and even character development at times. We don't want cutscenes taking us out of the experience for too long, but if the game can incorporate the personality of its bosses with the gameplay, that's a huge plus right there. If you haven't played Hi-Fi Rush, obviously we're about to spoil the entire thing. So bookmark this video and watch it later if you want to still play it fresh. Still, even if you know all the bosses on the set list, this game has a lot to offer, and hopefully hearing about it will convince a few of you to give it a try. So plug in your headphones and start bumping that MP3 player. It's time for the top 7 Hi-Fi Rush boss battles. Wait, 7? But there are only 6- Let's give it a go, go, go! But enough talk! Have at you! As we dismantle the corporate structure of the evil cybernetics company, we're pitted against the various leaders on Vanderlei's board of directors. This includes Sanzo, head of research and development. Who isn't a boss in this game? Dude, I just said he's the boss of research and development. Yeah, but he's not a boss battle. We don't actually fight him. Okay, yeah, you're right, but one, I wanted to make this video a little longer. And two, I thought this would be a good chance to highlight some of the great things that Hi-Fi Rush does with its antagonists. As a story, Hi-Fi Rush is very anti-corporation, in a way that's very topical. I mean, the main villain is an egotistical tech mogul branching out into political domination and mind control. I'd normally say it was clear who they were referencing, but we actually have multiple candidates nowadays. Never mind the fact that this is published by Bethesda, who just got bought by Microsoft. Not exactly a small mom-and-pop shop either. Each member of the board of directors is colorful, memorable, and such a joy to take down a peg. Helping this are the levels leading up to each boss fight where we hear the corresponding director over the intercom scheming and bantering while we fight through their defenses. For Zonzo, we learn that he's an absolute maniac. He thinks himself as a brilliant artist, but comes off more as a mad scientist. And as a manager, he's a nightmare, changing his ideas on a whim and forcing his workers to follow his erratic demands. I feel like the writers were drawing on experience in the gaming industry here. And this is what I was talking about earlier. I don't think we'd be fully appreciating the game if we don't acknowledge the themes written into the villains here. 
At one point, we hear a conversation where Roquefort, the head of finances, cuts off Zanzo's budget with Zanzo calling him an ingrate for letting the money limit his artistic vision. And I think that's a corporate phenomenon worth examining. We all want to say that the bottom line doesn't matter when it comes to impactful art, but Zanzo has no idea what he's actually making. He's just hiding behind a facade of vision and passion to justify his projects, which are all quantity and no quality. The Zanzo arc sees Chai and the gang exploiting this by goading Zanzo to use up all of his budget trying to stop them. More big machines and flashy shields until you get to the final showdown and his money has completely run out. No money, no power. It's one of the funnier examples of fake out boss fight that I can recall, and it's a complete and utter JoJo reference. Well, to be fair, Zanzo's whole character is a JoJo reference, and it is pretty funny. It's still kind of a letdown to me though, because I would have actually liked to fight him. I don't really care for jokes like this as an excuse to not have more worthwhile content in the game. But unlike, say, No More Heroes, Hi-Fi Rush only does this once, so I'm willing to give it a pass. Besides, if the developers ran low on resources and had to cut one or multiple boss fights, it's pretty funny to pick the guy that's most like a crazy game dev. I suppose you could argue that the entirety of Zanzo's level is the boss fight and the budget bar technically counts as a health bar, but regardless, this is the reason why we can't rank him over any of the actual boss fights. But he at least deserves a mention. Zanzo's a cautionary tale for anyone running a project. Work within your deadlines, be nice to your teammates, and just because you're a big nerd, it doesn't mean you're one of us. For the first actual boss on the list, we have the head of production, Rekka, a wrestling-themed Amazon who would like nothing more than to crush Chai into a little cube. And maybe it's fitting that we enlist her first, as she's the first member of the big six we have to take down in-game. Not the first boss overall, but we'll get to that. As such, Rekka sets the bar for what we should expect from future boss fights. She doesn't set the bar particularly high, but she is a good checkpoint to prove your skills with all the mechanics you've learned up to this point, while not feeling like a straight-up tutorial either. I almost wish she was a tutorial. Then we might be allowed to skip her. Ooh, that bad, huh? No, not exactly. She's actually pretty good, especially for the first run of the game. She makes a great first impression for how these boss fights are going to go down. It's actually on repeat playthroughs that I have a problem, but we should probably start with that first impression. As a character, Rekka is a good enough villain to hang alongside the others, but she's also the biggest jobber, if you know what I mean. You get an especially long time with her compared to the others, or rather, you get more levels with her on the intercom. Making her angry is a lot of fun because she's overconfident and vindictive just like a fun villain should be. But considering that this is the baseline for all villains moving forward, everyone gets to compare and contrast to what Rekka does, which leaves Rekka feeling a little vanilla. Also, she kind of reminded me of Misuzu, the first boss from River City Girls, and it made me wonder if assigning the Swole Lady as the first boss was becoming a thing. I do like the wrestling motif though, and how her boss fight uses the environment. Rekka's fight tests the skills you've only been using on mooks up until this point. You'll need to use the assist mechanic, as only Peppermint can pop her shields in the second and third phase. She also has some wide hitboxes, so you'll need to be good on your dodges to hop out of range, as well as the magnet grab to get back in there and finally deal some damage to Macho Woman Rekka Savage. And she only gets more savage as the fight progresses into phases 2 and 3, ripping up the floor to reveal a deadly mode of electrical wires and pulling out the pipes with her sick pythons. It's a good escalation, as you'll need to be more aware of your surroundings as the fight progresses. It's a great progression, certainly, for that first showdown. But once you get to know the game better, you start to see the flaws in this fight. For example, when you challenge her in New Game Plus with assists you didn't have the first time, you'll find that with the right timing, you can alternate between Peppermint's Air Jam combo and Corsica's High Alert counter to pretty much stunlock her, trivializing the fight in all three phases. This is on Rhythm Master difficulty, by the way. Not that I'm against fights that you can trivialize by getting good. That's part of the joy of character action games. The problem is, even if you're not taking damage, this fight can still take a long time for something completely unthreatening to you. Yeah, I can agree to that. The first time through, you might appreciate those slow wind-up attacks for teaching you how to dodge, but on your fifth playthrough, it means waiting that much longer before you can actually just start parrying everything. That's not even the half of it. Her juiced up mode has way too much downtime where you basically need to wait for Dwayne the Rekka Johnson to be vulnerable again. 
I personally hate uninteractive gameplay in video games, and Rekka is the first example in this game to show that to me. Plus, if you damage her too quickly in Phase 1, she seems to gain hyper armor and refuse to move into Phase 2 for a really long time. Not sure if that's a bug or a feature, but I'd like it to be fixed, please, Tango. And finally, the music in Rekka's fight isn't particularly memorable. Like, it's good, Free Radicals is super solid like her rock-hard abs, but Rekka's warm-up act can't stand up to the other headliners on this list. Leaving Rekka Van Dam at number 6. Okay, I'm not one for puns, but dude, kudos on the wrestling references. Thank you. So we mentioned that there's a boss fight that comes before Rekka. As a matter of fact, it's the only one that isn't a Vanderlei director. Which makes up for Zanzo, I suppose, but anyway. Here we have QA-1 Mil, a giant robot employed by Rekka for quality assurance. Unfortunately, QA has never really inspected anything that he didn't immediately want to disassemble. This, even more so than Rekka, is a tutorial boss. Or you can look at it as an early spectacle that hooks the player. Honestly, it's really good at being both. Like Metal Gear Rising, having a massive scale boss fight early on to hook the player is a win in my book. He's not a particularly fast robot, but it's just fast enough that I can at least pretend to be in awe here. The music definitely helps. I'm never gonna say no to a Nine Inch Nails song, and its placement here is well executed. Everything about this first battle plays to the strengths of Hi-Fi Rush's style. Help before the battle even begins, you can feel the intensity. Silence, and then the platform starts moving. The music kicks in, and Chai's heartbeat begins to pound as the platform continues to rise, as if the vibe of the game is mirroring the player's excitement with Chai's heartbeat. I'm just saying, this intro sequence is immaculately directed. Then, we get to the battle proper. Like Rekka, it doesn't take many playthroughs to easily no damage run this guy, but it also doesn't fall into the same snooze fest as Rekka when it gets easier. Sure, you can bring in assist moves from later in the game on repeat playthroughs, but interestingly enough, they don't really flow with this fight. I found that calling Peppermint, Macaron, and Corsica actually slowed me down and wasn't as efficient. This boss is best fought mano a mano, and I kind of like that. It's also got those quick time event moments that let you blast apart different sections of its face, an element you'll want to get used to for the rest of the game. But the way he breaks apart gives you multiple spots to damage him from. And being the biggest boss in the game, QA1 Mill has his own unique identity among the rest of the boss roster. But at the end of the day, he is the training wheels boss. His lack of any real flaws is enough to rank him above Rekka's slightly annoying match, but there's also not enough of a personality to build on, and despite the awesome lead up to his fight, he's gone without any real fanfare. Not even a rules of nature. Hang on, I got you covered. So, yeah, I'd say number 5 is good enough for 1 mil. So aside from Zonzo, who you just added to pad the video, who I just added to pad out the video, the first two bosses of the game are also the worst two bosses. And they're both still pretty darn good. <laughs> Coming in at number 4, we have Vandalay's Director of Finance, Roquefort. Fortunately for us, he's an old man with a small stature who could impossibly... Yeah, nice try, but I played enough games to know that you never underestimate the old guy. He's gonna roll back his shoulders, tear off his shirt and be totally ripped, or he's gonna bust out some crazy martial arts or mystical combat style that only a lifetime of dedication could have... <laughs> God, I knew this would be awesome, but I wasn't expecting Wolf Mech awesome. Yeah, I'm pretty sure DeviantArt went crazy with this guy. And you would know that because... I'm on DeviantArt, dude. I'm a degenerate. Everyone on DeviantArt is a degenerate. Besides, it's not like you're innocent. I've seen your... Twin. Anyway... When they said Roquefort was a wolf in sheep's clothing, they meant it literally. It's made even better when you notice he's still wearing his work attire. My favorite part is a tie. Mine's the little monocle. All the better to see you with. And the boss theme is classical music. I had a feeling you'd say that. 
Wasn't Yinu your favorite boss in No Straight Roads? Most of the game's soundtrack is rooted in some sort of rock. Rofort gives us this trap mix of... That one song you've heard a million times. What is it called? Beethoven's Fifth. Thank you. But anyway, yeah, this fight is amazing. It is, but I still have some reservations about it. On concept alone, it's one of the best, and certainly has higher highs than one mil or Rekka, but also some lows that I can't really overlook. Well, let's start with the good. Roquefort's another three-phase boss fight, and in each phase you need to contend with this giant Lupine Decepticon first, weaving between his swipes until you've done enough damage to knock him out of his armor. Then he'll transform to his human form and roll out, forcing you to chase him down. Hit his wrinkled ass enough times and he'll move on to the next phase. Each phase is punctuated with a change in scenery. Phase 1 takes place in his office, Phase 2 blasts you into the wall of the vault, and Phase 3 drops down into his Scrooge McDuck money pit. He even swims in the gold ducktail style. Let's take this someplace a bit more secure, so we don't disturb the neighbors. Is the safe really that secure if you can knock the door off its hinges that easily? Well, I mean, have you seen how strong this wolf is? His moves are pretty well telegraphed once you know what to look out for, but his dash attacks have surprising range, and his claws are some of the most damaging attacks in the game, so there's not a lot of margin for error. He is pretty easy to parry once you understand his pattern, but knowing the price of failure definitely adds some tension. My problem is whenever he's running from you. This little coward won't stay still, he keeps putting up shields that you need to either pop with peppermint or macaron, and that's always kind of been an issue I've had with the game, because you need a certain assist and it's on cooldown, and you're pretty much stuck until it's back up again. Teaches you not to mash your assists, though. Eh, kinda. But then in Phase 2, he's got the laser grids that grind the fight to a halt while you wait for an opening. I'm fine with there just being quiet time in games that slow down the pacing, but this? This is just torture. Yeah, I can understand the frustration, but personally, I don't mind it. You're switching roles between Predator and Prey constantly throughout the fight, and it forces you to master your combo string so you can get in as much damage as possible before he weasels away again. You also have the Magnet Grab to keep up with him, and your allies to keep the herd on consistently. Anything you can do to punish him without being too greedy yourself. It's a test of patience, but also opportunism. I'm not calling it bad at all. It just feels a little less natural than the next three bosses on the list. And just so I'm covering all my bases, I don't really like these counter segments with Corsica that they start throwing in the second phase. The mechanic itself is fine, I like it when it happens in other fights, but you'll probably need to do this around like three times throughout the boss fight and it starts to feel like it's just interrupting you from attacking normally. I wish it only happened during the third phase right at the end, and it does make for an awesome finishing blow, just not when I've done it twice already. As for me, my issue comes from what happens when you figure out how to actually cheese the fight. Like we said earlier, Roquefort does a lot of damage, but once you realize that most of his attacks are grounded, you can abuse Chai's magnet grab and aerial attacks to safely whittle down Roquefort's health by simply whacking him in the face. It's not 100% safe, but it does turn this boss from one of the harder fights in the game to one of the easiest. Still one hell of a spectacle though. Can't argue with that. So, have you ever played Resident Evil 4? Uh, no. Rhetorical question, Mac. That was for the audience. Oh, sorry. But, actually though? The horror was never really my thing. Well, it's not really a horror. I thank you for your gift. You know what? Fair enough. More to the point, you know how in the original Resident Evil 4 there was that cutscene when Krauser first shows up and you get into a night fight? The whole thing is dialogue about Leon and Krauser having a pass, and then BOOM! Quick time event! Instant death! This is a commonly despised segment in Resi 4, to the point where the remake just made it a bona fide real-time boss fight. Expositions and quick time events don't often mix, because how is a player supposed to process the dialogue when they're paranoid the next button prompt can appear at any moment? Tap A quickly to not die as fast! Well, Hi-Fi Rush pretty much does that, but it's actually done well here. After all that talk about the no-holds-barred slugfest with Roquefort that spans multiple set pieces and uses every mechanic in the game, Corsica might seem like a step back. It's essentially just Simon Says, a series of call-and-response bits interspersed with dialogue. You might even call it a cop-out, a minigame in place of a boss fight, not much better than Zanzo's anticlimactic demise. But for what it is, Corsica's tightly choreographed showdown stands as a highlight of the adventure, largely for how well it integrates with the story. At this point in their mission, Peppermint's team of rebels noticed that while most of the big six are reprehensible lunatics, Corsica, the head of security, seems much more reasonable, 
surmising that she might just be unaware of the darker dealings of Vanderlei Technologies. So, if they could just talk to Corsica, maybe she could defect and become a powerful ally. The problem is, getting to the head of security isn't going to be easy because, well, she's the head of security. Okay, seriously, why isn't Mech saying anything? Wow. Oh, right. Corsica's your favorite. Mm hmm. You want to take it from here then? Absolutely. While most bosses have around two levels of intercom chatter to characterize them, there's a whopping five leading up to Corsica's battle, giving us plenty of time to gauge her personality. She's hot headed, she's an overachiever, she likes to do things her way, but she's also got a clear moral code. And while she's not ready to jump ship just yet, she's obviously suspicious of her employer. At the same time, this gives a lot of time to develop Chai. Sure, he's a nice guy who's naturally against evil corporate dictatorship, but trying to reason with Corsica gives him a chance to consider how devoted he really is to this cause, whether he wants to give his life for it or if he's just here to get that MP3 player out of his chest. The prior levels built Corsica and Chai up as foils, one honorable but misguided, the other a soldier of good by mere happenstance. If you've been playing the game up until this point and you know anything about visual storytelling, then you'll probably know what's going to happen prior to Mission 7. What takes place is a completely predictable sequence that everyone and their mother saw coming. We want to take her in willingly, talk her down while avoiding her attacks. Hi-Fi doesn't pull this trick twice. You face Corsica with nothing but your simple parry, utilizing unique sequences you've already practiced on other enemies prior. And with the third phase in sight, we get some of the best dialogue in the game, I know you're not like the others, Corsica. You can feel something's wrong. Chai, you are surprisingly convincing. Then Chai screws it up. Or are you just too oblivious to figure that out? Oh, come on! That's it. Now I'm mad! And then the music kicks in. The cinematic and gameplay direction of this fight is immaculate. While Chai is great at dodging and parrying, he's no one's first choice for diplomacy. Some of Hi-Fi Rush's best writing takes place during this boss fight. Chai's being cocky, Corsica's being salty, and everyone else at HQ are losing their minds over how much Chai is screwing this up. Halfway through though, Chai decides he's just no good at debate club and decides to try and antagonize her, drawing out her attacks until she's too tired to fight anymore. It shows a lot of character growth in Chai, showing that he's committed to the cause and willing to acknowledge his own strengths and weaknesses. Plus he's patient and knows not to hurt Corsica, intentionally. Yeah, skipping ahead, watching Chai try to carry Corsica's unconscious body out of the facility had me cackling. And yeah, the fight really is a simple case of bop it. Buttons show up, you hit them, but there are many factors that make this work better than it would in most other action games. First of all, this is a rhythm game. Timed inputs are kind of expected. Second of all, while there's a lot going on in the conversation, there's a clear delineation between cutscene and gameplay. You know when you can just take in the story and when you have to start pushing buttons. And third is the way these specific quicktime events work in this game. It's a mechanic you learn way back in Zonzo's level in which they're played to you first in a sequence of beats. As a result, you have a crucial moment to understand the rhythm of what you're doing so you can respond accordingly. And even if you fail, your punishment is a simple damage drop as opposed to instant death, and you're thrown right back in to try again. This whole fight feels more like a duel, her attacking and you responding. And, to praise once again, the layered music and unique lighting to this scene are just mm, chef's kiss. Seriously, Negotiation might be the game's best track, at least to me. Does that about cover it? I'd say so, yes. Corsica's fight is a small package, but I adore what we got. I'd personally say it's perfect, but of course it's still essentially a minigame fight. Plus, Corsica's attack strings are always the same even on higher difficulties, making this one of the easier bosses to get a perfect rating on. But what you see is what you get. Its only real flaw is that it can't compare to the next two bosses, who match Roquefort in complexity and improve in quality. For what it's worth though, Corsica's got that same quality. Well that's a look, what's with you? I hate you. What did I do? Not you. Her. Now hit it! Oh boy, here we go. So yeah, Mimosa is a total narcissist. I always hate those kinds of characters too, which is why I find it strange that I love this fight so much. 
Maybe it's because I get to whack her in that stupid placid face. This is where Oscar and I had the most disagreement. Mimosa, the head of marketing for Vandalay and an influential pop star, is the fourth boss you fight in the game. She's also considered the hardest boss in the game by many fans, and I personally think she's hard for all the wrong reasons. As for me, I think this fight is amazing. Fittingly for a famous performer, this boss fight is a stage show with a roaring crowd, discotheque lighting, and best of all, an electronic jazz orchestra cheering you on. Mimosa's boss theme, which is a cover of Fiona Apple's as fast as you can by the way, is the only boss theme to incorporate triplets. And considering you're likely used to the 4-4 time signature used throughout the entire game, this shift in syncopation and attack patterns that are artfully off the beat keeps you on your toes. I mean, yeah, that's the cool part, but it's not her attacks that bother me. If anything, she doesn't have enough of them. The real problem is her defense. Mimosa sports this transforming dress that serves as a pair of wings and an impenetrable shield. It's a great visual flourish, but in battle, you have to keep stunning her with assists just to put the shield down, and she restores it only a few seconds later. If you're not right on top of her, you might miss the attack window entirely. Well, of course she's not going to stay down for long. You gotta use the magnet grab. Well, look, I don't need her to stay stunned. I'd be fine if she recovered quickly and started moving normally again, so long as the shield stayed down just a little bit longer. Essentially, she has two modes, invincible and vegetable. I just want to fight her like a normal boss. Like, I know that I complained about Roquefort, but at least you were actually trading blows in that fight. In this fight, I just feel like I'm spamming assist moves, and that just doesn't feel right to me in a character action game. I even found an exploit where you can destroy most of her shield while she's getting up if you just summon all your friends at once. It's cheap, and I admittedly kind of feel bad for doing it, but the shield is so annoying that I'm always tempted to do so anyway. It almost feels like it was designed for this exploit. Okay, yeah, I'm not gonna act like that's not annoying at all, but I suppose I was never bothered by the downtime in these fights. It feels more like a dance to me. They get a verse when they're on the attack, and then it's my turn to cave their skull in during the chorus. And as for the attacks themselves, well, you can't say that there isn't variety. Yeah, the attacks she adds in phases 2 and 3 don't really add much to me, besides just creating more area control that slows things down. I mean, this one literally traps you in a box. I could weave around these lasers and sound waves to break my way out, but it's just easier to friend spam the turrets while I effortlessly jump over everything. Well hey, far be it from me to tell people that they shouldn't be annoyed by these particular details, but I personally never had an issue with them. Plus, this isn't all there is to it. It's the sections in between the main phases that really elevate this fight for me. There's a lights out section where you can use the magnet grab to find her quickly in the group of backup dancers, and this dance off section that feels straight out of Space Channel 5. You can compare this to the mechanic that they used later in Roquefort's battle where Corsica helps you out, but I feel like it works better here. Yeah, I gotta agree there. The dance-off is just a funny moment, and you only do it once in this fight, which makes it feel special, rather than the bunch of smaller times like with Roquefort. They even sneak a Simon Says section in there like with the Corsica fight. Corsica wore it better, but I like reprising it here for the final blow of the fight. To me, it feels like we keep building a bigger arsenal of game mechanics that let the bosses keep getting more complex. There's complexity, sure, but Mimosa just gives me a headache. Yeah, I'll grant you that. She is tough, perhaps even frustrating. Some of her moves are particularly egregious, and she's gonna be a wall for many new players. But she's a wall that I enjoy busting down. So much so that I was able to negotiate with Mech and get her at the number two spot. Your channel, your rules. And I will not be silenced. I call it a compromise, but it really is the only place that we disagreed here. And we both knew that only one character deserved the number one spot. As for Mimosa herself, I still think her performance is worthy of second place. Even if I'd never be caught dead at one of her concerts. Ooh. I love this game, but wow, I do feel like I have a lot of bones to pick with most of the bosses. I might have given the audience the wrong impression. No worries, dude. You're fine. It's clear we both love this game. We're just very analytical about it. In fact, that's probably our way of appreciating it. I know, but it's like, I've played the game for way longer than you have, and I've noticed these things, so I feel like I need to say something. I really haven't been that much of a downer the whole video. Not at all, dude. In fact, why don't you introduce our number one? Yes, sir. So... Zanzo notwithstanding, we have the list of six bosses here. The first two bosses of the game, while good, are also the two worst bosses of the game. And it feels great to say that the best boss is the one they save for last. The boss of the company, Kale Vandalay. This guy works so well as the villain of this game. 
for me at least, he's lovable and hateable at the same time. Sort of a handsome Jack thing going on. Kale is arrogant, inconsiderate, and kind of pathetic. Like, he's not completely incompetent, he clearly has some technological know-how to run the company, but let's not forget that he inherited his position, and he's gotten by largely through the work of more talented people. He's not the best at anything in his company, while the other department heads are wiser, savvier, stronger, smarter, and more charismatic. And most importantly, he's lazy. I'd say that's actually his biggest character flaw. He wants everything in the world, but he's too lazy to do anything to get it. He has his directors handle all of his problems until they're eliminated one by one. His entire evil plan to mind control the masses is because he thinks marketing his products is too hard. He'd rather just brain hack the consumers and let an algorithm determine what they buy. Hmm. Seems familiar. If he can do that, he won't need to worry about making products people actually want. They'll just buy it because they have to. Of course, this ultimately causes him more trouble than if he just, you know, made his products better, but it gets out of hand because all he knows is the path of least resistance. Hell, his last words are, This is just too much work. You can almost think of Kale as a version of Chai that never helped Peppermint or the others. And yet we can't help but like him, probably because he's so extra. Like, you can tell he's trying so hard to look like everything is under control, and aside from the moments when his facade cracks and he screams at one of his underlings, he actually is cool. Or maybe it's just the voice. Roger Craig Smith is a vocal genius. When Kale gets up during the fight and says, <laughs> Come on, Chai. That gets me fired up every time. And his Iron Man suit transforms into coattails and a collar. Who the hell does this guy think he is? But enough about the character. Let's talk about this three-phase boss fight. Well, three and a half phases, you can say, because first Chai is mind-controlled and 808 becomes a UFC fighter for 30 seconds. I do kind of wish that there was more to this segment. You kind of just double jump some waves and get a quick time event, but it is a fun little moment. Then the true battle begins. It's just as hard as Mimosa's battle, but this time for all the right reasons. Putting every skill you have to the test, finding your openings to attack, calling in assists at the right times, dodging, parrying. You even get some of those Simon Says showdowns. Kale's moves are simple to understand, but difficult to avoid consistently. You'll have to really focus and adapt to learn the patterns. And more so than any other fight, you need to dodge with the beat. One thing that I appreciate about Hi-Fi Rush, it's that it's willing to help you out for a while if you're not great with rhythm games. Combos and super attacks take specific timing, but basic attacks always delay to be on beat automatically. It's a good way to learn how to fight like a dancer, but by the time you reach the final battle, the game's long since stopped holding your hand. Kind of like Chai who wants to be a rock star but doesn't actually know how to play the guitar, you might have started this game with little experience in rhythm games, but have slowly improved your skill as you progress through the adventure. You're riding so high, you might not even notice that the training wheels fell off your bike three miles ago. You've come a long way, and now you're ready for the ultimate test. Plus, the evil tower backdrop of this fight is amazing, the soundtrack is pulling out all the stops with the perfect drug by Nine Inch Nails, everything about this fight is just perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Go ahead, Mac, it's fine. Okay, thankfully, this time, it's a quick list. Three things. The first problem is the dreaded Phase 2 curse. Like Rote for Rekka and Mimosa, Kale gets really hard to damage in this middle section, and there's a lot of downtime. He grows these Dr. Octopus arms. That look awesome! Yes, they look awesome, but each one has to be countered by a specific assist move before you can destroy them. Until you do that, he's untouchable, and you have to wait for him to do very specific moves that you can counter. Macaron slams his bludgeons into the ground, Corsica puts out the fire, and Peppermint shatters the solar lens. Eventually, I found myself just standing at mid-range waiting for him to do the right thing. Yeah, I can understand that. The waiting isn't too appreciated. The second is that it's also kind of exploitable? A single Grand Slam combo can take out his arms on hard difficulty or lower and a jam combo takes them out on very hard and Rhythm Master. So either I wait forever, or I do the you win combo. Fortunately, both of these problems are only in phase two. The last case is more of a case of wanting more, narratively speaking. I wish the dialogue took cues from the Corsica fight. Maybe they could have interspersed it more between phases. But despite showing up for assists, the other members of Chai's team are trapped behind a laser wall for the whole fight, and they don't really have much to say. Especially Peppermint. I mean, this is her brother we're fighting here. Yeah, and if you think about it, Macaron and Corsica are both ex-employees of his. Chai's probably the one least personally attached to Kale. 
so it would have been nice to get bigger moments from the others, but at least we get a little of that with this last set of quick time events stringing together a well choreographed team wombo combo. But other than that, it's very well crafted. It's a fitting end to an amazing game, and the only choice for the game's best boss fight. I'm the Green Scorpion. And I'm Mecha Salt Man. And if you haven't played Hi-Fi Rush yet, consider this our glowing recommendation. And if you have played it, do you agree with our order? Do you disagree? Let us know in the comments. And while we're talking about new things, go check out Mecha Salt Man on YouTube. Seriously, dude, it was great having you on. I mean, it was only a top six. Top seven, Mech. This was a top seven. Well, it was great to be here. And I hope it was as fun to watch as it was to write and record. But it couldn't possibly be as fun as taking down the big six yourself. Get yourself a copy of Hi-Fi Rush and have yourself a good time. Rock on, everybody.